Um, so first things first, uh, what is a false relation? Um, well, the uh, definition from Grove Music Online says a con chromatic contradiction between two notes sounded together. So a less posh way to say that is just to say a catch. That's the first and only joke in the, in the um, program, by the way. So if you didn't laugh at that, the rest is all downhill from there. So the first uh, thing I thought was just to talk a little bit about etymology. So firstly, why false or cross relation and why is it called a relation in the first place? Well, the word relation, as I'm sure you know, just means a connection between two things. And we could have a um, harmonic relation, which would be say a perfect fit. So that would be um, our lovely consonant relation between two notes. Um, another way of saying false relation is a cross relation. Um, and cross, as you probably know, is a kind of shortening of a cross. Um, and there's a kind of um, definition for that, which means opposing. So if you have say an F with an F sharp, those two notes together are kind of opposing each other when you hear them together, it feels like an opposition, doesn't it? And an even more, I suppose, negative way of thinking about a false relation is um, the actual word false rather than cross relation. Um, and you can see all these definitions here, false and fake, but it also has this connection with musica ficta or musica falsa, which we're going to talk about a little bit later in the lecture. So that's maybe a, a little etymo etymological introduction to the word. Um, I found this great video by a kind of enthusiast called Elen Rotam, who's going to tell us a little bit more about the two versions of a false relation. So I'll try and play this and hopefully you can hear it. Uh, let me know if not after it. Oops, sorry. Let me just go back to that. The English term false relation or cross relation refers mostly to a situation in which a note in one voice is the same as a note in another voice, regardless of its octave, except that it has been altered by an accidental. The two notes can appear either simultaneously, which renders the harshest effect, like so, or one after the other, non-simultaneously, which is still disturbing, but less so like so. This phenomenon is the focus of this episode. I find it particularly interesting that he discusses the non-simultaneous relation as still disturbing. <laughs> but to me, to modern ears, the non-simultaneous relation, which with the second of those two, F sharp and a D followed by an F and an A, does not sound that disturbing at all. But whereas the F sharp and the F are disturbing, the first of those two. So we're, we're going to focus mainly on the simultaneous false relation today. So how common was this in William Byrd's music? Well, I had a look at a thesis by um, this guy Montgomery from Richmond University from 1968. And he's done a, a, a large scale survey of um, works by Byrd, not all of them, but particularly vocal works. And he examined 157 and found 24 instances of the cross relation, simultaneous cross relation which means that it's not you know really common it's not in every piece but it's also not to be scoffed at it's not just in a couple of pieces it's probably in one in six according to this study anyway um he looked through the cantionis sacre of 1575 which is the famous um collection with talis two more cantionis sacre and the gradualia written when he was in standard massey standard massey um when he was a lot more bold about his catholicism in a um, protestant country and then also he looked through the some a secular collection as well of songs from 1589. So Alain Roth is going to tell us a little bit more about one of the most famous pieces that we've sung of Bird recently which you might be able to guess um, but I'm going to play this for you now. The rightfully famous and beautiful motet Ave Verum Corpus by William Bird has a non-simultaneous false relation right at the beginning I'll sing the bass and play the other voices. But this is just a tease compared with the simultaneous... Just to say that first bit that you heard was a non-simultaneous relation. You heard an F sharp in that second bar followed by an F natural. And again, it's not 
to my ears, it's not that shocking, but at the time it was potentially more surprising. But here we go on now. These false relations that are used later at misere remei have mercy upon me. While the tenor is on F sharp, the bass comes from below and hits an F natural. Let's listen to the tenor alone. Now to the bass alone. Very often, the false relation is a consequence of smooth and well-written individual lines that only contradict each other on the vertical level. Let's listen now to the two voices together. In this case, it seems that Bird used the false relation in order to amplify the expressive moment in the text. All right, and I wanted to go through a couple of other examples as well that we haven't sung, well, not with me anyway. Um, the first is Tribuet Domine, which is um, a really big motet from this early collection of 1575. Um, it's a large scale and it's 12 minutes long in three sections. And it only has one false relation in, but I think it's a bit of a humdinger. So, I hope you can see this score. Um, this is just, just five bars of the piece. I'm gonna play the, um, play the a recording by the 16. I'm gonna use my mouse just to show you where we are because it's a bit hard to catch it. So I'll just show you where we are with the mouse, hopefully. Okay, so can everyone here see the circled section of my screen? I hope so. Um, because this is where there's, I think, an amazing false relation. Um, have a look at the soprano part. Da, 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 da. You have a rising minor seven. And then in the altos, sine, you have the F sharp at the same time as that F natural. Um, the reason this is quite striking is because you don't normally have the false relation between the top two parts. And you also don't normally have um, such a big gap between them with nothing else in between. It's normally hidden more in the texture. Um, one reason for why this dramatic false relation is there, I think, could be the, the text, the meaning of the text. Have a look over here. Cuius imperium sine fine manet, which means, paraphrased, whose reign is without end. And particularly the word reign, that glorious word, you have the uh, ascent of the minor seventh up here. Um, if you have a look in the alto line here, you have exactly the same line, but um, down a minor six. So the same thing happens up here for the sopranos. Um, so there's two reasons. It might be the text and it might be just a, a dogmatic following this uh, minor seven um, ascent here. I'm going to show you one more bird example now. This one I think is particularly striking. It's O Salutaris Costia. I'm actually going to play the whole piece um, and if you want you can sing along or just have a listen. I'm going to stop it once halfway through and it's about two minutes long. I'm just going to stop it there to show you the very first false relation. Alto twos have the um, A flat against the um, A natural in the tenor. So tenor twos have um, and the alto twos have quite So starting on that nasty scrunch between the A flat and the A natural, I kind of love it. But wait, there's more to come. I'm going to play the rest of the piece now.
so Mike definitely loves that one. Um, if you have a look down here at this uh, little note, the, the excessive occurrence of cross relations in this piece, I mean, even if you can't see them so quickly as you go through the score, you can hopefully hear the kind of jarring dissonances there. Um, it wasn't published during his lifetime, which is really interesting, but it's a re the, the result is of a strict canon between three of the parts. Um, so we're going to think about maybe why this wasn't published during his lifetime. I personally love it. Um, so um, just thinking about Bird's contemporaries, um, in particular Thomas Tallis, so who was, uh, you know, just a bit older than Bird, a bit more experienced, obviously, to the younger um, composer, and, and probably was some kind of teacher, if not mentor, to the, to the younger man. So going back to this Tim Montgomery thesis, he, he only looked at 13 motets, but five of them contain a simultaneous cross-relation, which is obviously a slightly bigger proportion. Um, let's have a look at another piece that we sang at, um, uh, in March, just briefly. Oh, sorry. Um, let me just try that again. So let's see if this works. <laughs> As you know, this lovely cross, cross relation here between the C sharp in the superior part and then the C natural in the quinta part. Um, so that's the first one. Interestingly, on those words, properties for the lost, which I, I find very moving and beautiful. Just play the end now. Ah, sorry. I'm just going to play the end of that piece. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so at the end as well, we have another kind of false relation, just to bring that stunning, very simple motet to a close. So if we're thinking about other British composers, um, we're going to talk about Thomas Morley. Um, and we sang a piece of Morley in the March concert as well. He is about Bird's contemporary, and he wrote this plain and easy introduction to practical music in 1597, which is basically a, a treaty of musical theory. Um, that's what the first page looks like, which I kind of love. And amazingly, on the second page of the document, or of the treaty, he's um, dedicated it to William Byrd. So at the top he says, the most excellent musician, Master William Byrd, one of the gentlemen of Her Majesty's Chapel. And then he goes on to kind of say what an inspiration Byrd is and, and say why he's dedicating it to, to Byrd. But have a look at this. So Morley gives an example of a, a cadence which actually has a false relation at the end. If you think of this as the bass line, so this is a G, we have G, F sharp, E, F sharp, G, da, da, da. Now that's a D and it goes da, 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 F natural, da, 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 da. So you have the F natural against an F sharp in the bass part. So again, this is a clear false relation and Morley says, such endings were unpleasant and harsh. Although they pleased some musicians from earlier times and even some contemporary ones, they were always condemned by the most skillful in England. And later he goes on to say, such cadences are written in an old and stale manner. You can actually read this down here, by the way. If you can notice that the S's kind of look like F's, you just have to watch out for that. Pleased here. Um, so yeah, there's, this is a bit bizarre because he's, he's dedicated this book, this uh, right piece of writing to Bird, but yet he's also saying that false relations at a cadence are, are rubbish, are completely harsh. And um, there's a couple of reasons for this. I don't know the answer. It could have been that um, by the end of the century, so 1597, this was going out of style. And I did have a look at some of the later publications of Bird do have slightly less false relations in than earlier ones. So that could be a thing. Or perhaps he was criticizing his, his uh, you know, 
colleague and um, friend Bird in this small section of the treaty. I don't know. Um, but Ave Verum Corpus, for example, was written in 1605-ish, so that was after this treaty was written. Um, and that has those amazing false relations at the end, so yeah, I don't really know what the answer is there. If we're thinking about other um, contemporary theorists, um, there is this book, Le Istituzioni Ammoniche, by Giuseppe Zarlino, written in 1558, um, which looks like this. Um, so there's an Italian theorist. And in Italy, they called the same thing a mi contra fa. So contra meaning against. Uh, mi is, is e, basically, and fa is f. So e against f. So imagine playing e against f on the piano. It's a kind of semitone clash. I kind of love that name, mi contra fa. Or a relatio non harmonica. Um, and he suggests that, he suggests that non-simultaneous progressions should definitely be avoided. And he actually writes them here. B and B flat, and this is a certain clef, which is a B and then a D. So you have G and B, and then B flat and D. So again, it's this non-simultaneous cross-relation, but he says that they're annoying for sensitive ears. And he doesn't even mention simultaneous false relations, basically saying that, you know, that they're the devil's work, in other words. So it certainly wasn't um, kind of encouraged by him. So the question is, are these false relations uh, written by any other composers? So are they written by Italian composers? Any false relations in the work of Palestrina? What do you think? I can't actually hear anyone, but shout out if you want to unmute yourself. Yes or no to Palestrina? Not sure. Kathy is saying, shaking her head, which I think means no, so she's correct. Palestrina, you don't find any false relations in Palestrina. And then ger famous German composers of the 16th century. Well, this is, I'm cheating slightly. I'm just describing Lassus as a German composer because he's, he was based in Munich for so many years and he, he picked up so many of the, the kind of German styles for that century. So any false relations in Lassus? So any ideas? It's not an easy question. I'm gonna tell you the answer. It's no. Zero false relations in Lassus, not that I've found anyway, um, but he has written 2,000 pieces, so uh, I haven't been through all of them. Um, what about Franco-Flemish composers like Joscan, um, Gombert, the kind that we were doing in tribute just now? Any ideas? Okay, I'm going to give the answer, which is yes. <laughs> so let's have a listen to this. It's the Mille Regret by um, Gombert that we sang a few months ago as we were preparing for our virtual tribute programme. I'm just going to play you about 45 seconds of this. Oh, sorry. So this is a gorgeous recording, I think, by Stile Antico, who do this music so well. So here's Gombert. Ah, sorry. Let me see if this works now. That's it. So I'm just stopping it there. I don't, you have to be quite canny to notice this, but if you look at this, bar 20, da, 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 they actually sharpen this G to a G sharp there. And at the same time, you have the um, tenors going, e -te -no, and G sharp. So there's a beautiful false relation there. Interestingly, it's not written in though. So let's just have a think about that. These are the other Franco-Flemish composers who um, use these false relations quite frequently. 
Um, we often call uh, these, these final cadences with a false relation an English cadence. And the question is why? Because if, we, if they use it on the continent as well, why do we call it English? Well, there's not a set answer, but this might give us a clue. So have a look at this. It's, it's a piece from Talus. It's his Lamentations of Jeremiah. So I'm just going to play you this little cadence here. Ready? Okay, so that was it. <laughs> Very short. And in the tenor line here, so you have this C sharp, C natural against the C sharp here. And in other words, a classic English cadence. Um, however, have a look at this piece by Gombert. It's a, um, a piece called Hey Dias. I had to write this out on Sibelius, so just bear with it. But, but see if you can notice the relationship between this and the Jeremiah Lamentations. Okay, so just have a look at this second bar here. And if I go back to the, the talus, have a look at the second bar there. Go back to the gombert. So what's the relationship between those two? Does anyone want to be bold and unmute themselves and say what they think? Any similarities? Well, isn't, isn't it the same? It's except the same. That, <laughs> except that you don't have the cadence, uh, you don't have the, um, if they've taken the C sharp out. Yeah, or, uh... Exactly, exactly. So you're right. Um, thank you to anyone who said they're the same. They're exactly the same cadence. Um, in this Gombert, you notice that this is still left as a C natural, supposedly. But um, that's because, well, we'll find out in a second. Um, but it's interesting that this is an English cadence, isn't it? So the, the English cadence isn't necessarily just an English thing, but it might be that within English writing a bit later on in the 16th century, they actually start to write in these false relations. When it's earlier, it's actually just thicker. So we can argue about whether that should be sharpened or not, um, which might mean that's why we think of it as an English thing, because it starts to be a bit more standardized by the time we got to bird. All right, so why did this practice exist? I actually asked Keith Bennett about false relations because he knows what he's doing. And he answered me this, false relations might not take that long to explain anyway. There are sort of composed musica ficta resulting from the horizontal movement of hexachords. I thought that was quite a, a, an amazing sentence because I think that's a very complica complicated sentence. <laughs> so I love that Keith just thought, you know, that's easy to explain. There were just a com composed music of Victor resulting from the horizontal movement of hexachords, obviously. Um, but if you look down here, English composers uh, perhaps being more conservative in this respect than their continental contemporaries, which is interesting. The Palestrina generation has smoothed them all the way. And he's definitely right here. By the time we got to Palestrina, or not even by the time, Palestrina smoothed these away. But at the same time in England, they were not, were, were not being smoothed away. And it's interesting that that might actually be conservative rather than forward thinking. We're just going to, we've only got kind of five minutes now, but I'm just going to talk about this sentence and unpack it a little bit because, because um, Keith is completely right, but I just think it's uh, complicated. So firstly, what is musica ficta? Um, the way I would explain it is in early music, um, sometimes even earlier than what we've just been looking at, so 12th century to 16th century, you wouldn't have the accidentals written in, that each, each singer would have their part book and there'd be certain um, norms that they'd be used to that they would put in accidentals without it being written in. That's my, my version of it. Here's a Grove Dictionary version and another version about in modern day. It's loosely applied to all unnotated inflections, which is basically as I've just said. And notice that, um, oh, another word for musica ficta is musica falsa. And I think that might be where the false relation came from, but I'm not sure. 
Um, and the last thing to know about Keith's answer is this hexachord thing. So what's a hexachord? Can I sum up a hexachord in three minutes? And to be honest with you, no, I can't. It's too complicated. But I'm going to try and show you this two minute video and see if that answers our questions. And then I'll explain a little bit more. So here's a quick video I'm going to play for us now. Have a look at this. It might make it a tiny bit clearer what a hexachord is. Oh, sorry. This one I'm still in it. Okay. Around the 10th century, Western music looked like this. If you want to learn more about why medieval music looked this way, check out this video on how the music clefs got their shapes. Now, if this was written in modern notation, it would look something like this. These were the only notes being used in conventional Western music at the time. 20 notes plus two accidentals, and each note had its own name. I'm not talking like today's music where each note is one of the seven letters of the musical alphabet, a, B, C, D, E, F, or G. No, each one of these notes had a particular name, which included the note name, but also its positions in the hexachord system. Okay. Oh, no! Sorry, I was trying to stop it so I could just explain a tiny bit to you. Now I've got one minute to explain what he's talking about with this diagram. Let me try and A, C, D, E, F, or G. No, each one of these notes had a particular name, which included the note name, but also its positions in the hexachord system. Okay, so a hexachord is not a chord, it's a scale, and it's a scale of six notes. And the six notes um, start in different places, and they always have the same proportions between them. So I'm going to sing you a hexachord, which is this. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la. So basically C to A is a hexachord. Um, they always have the same proportions in that C, D, E all have a tone between them. And then E to F has a semitone between them. And then F, G, A has tones between it. And you can find this hexachord this, with the same proportions, cone, tone, tone, semitone, tone, tone, tone in four, three different places in our normal scale. So the first place is at G, at the bottom. G, A, B, C, D, E. And then you have one starting on C. C, D, E, F, G, A. And then you also have one starting on F, as you can see here. F, G, A, B, C, D. So those are the three places that the hexachords start. And the reason why this causes false relations is as so. If I sang Ave Maria by Parsons and I started it, um, say, on a C, just for the sake of argument. Ave Maria. And then I sang it on a G as well. So the next imitative entry comes in on the G. That's how the Renaissance composers would think of it. Ave Maria. So far, so good. But what if we started on an F hexachord? Ave Maria. We can't use a B natural, we have to use a B flat there. Ave Maria. What that means is if I sang the hexachord starting on F at the same time as something starting on G was happening, Ave and Ave Maria, you'd have a B flat and a B natural happening at the same time, and that's a false relation. So that's my extremely potted uh, explanation of what a hexachord is and why it would cause a false relation in this early music. However, I have got one disagreement with uh, what Keith suggested, which is that I don't think that it was only because of that. When I look at some of this music by Talis and Bird, and I look at the way that the um, false relations are used at these particular textual moments, I really feel that they we're using the clash of that dissonance, um, not just as a byproduct, but as an uh, emotional tool. Um, so just looking at that miserere from the Ave Verum as, as a good example there. And actually in the background, you can see the original part book, but it's a little bit blurry. Okay, so to finish, to summarize, I'll just say these four summaries. False relations are often associated strongly with England. 
and particularly with Hallis and Bird and, and Shepherd as well, who we sang in March. Much less popular in Italy, um, particularly with Palestrina, and uh, many theory theorists consider them improper. Where did they come from? Well, they evolved out of the Musica Ficta of earlier 15th to 16th century Franco-Flemish repertoire, and also some Spanish and Portuguese repertoire from the earlier times. It can be attributed to these use of hexachords, but in some cases, I feel that it isn't. I feel that it deliberately responds to the text. They were later used by a myriad of composers willing to break the rules, including Henry Purcell. And just to finish off, I thought we could maybe sing a piece by Henry Purcell. So you're still all on mute, so feel free to sing along. Um, it's his amazing Hear My Prayer, O Lord. And in this, um, you know, the first tune, Hear my prayer, O Lord, it's a minor third. And then you have, and let my crying. So you have B flat to B natural. He's always playing with this idea of the minor third and the major third. And that creates a lot of cross relations within the piece. It's absolutely fantastic. I feel that he's drawing back to this, harking back to the earlier style, but also now it's notated. So we don't have any question as to what he, his, uh, his um, intention was. So here we go. Feel free to sing along with this gorgeous 16 recording of Hear My Prayer. All right, so I'm going to stop the sharing now, if I can. Oh, I can't change it, hang on a sec. Um, oh, here we go. As that is the end of the session, of the lecture. So um, feel free to let me know if you have any questions and I'll try and answer them. And maybe unmute yourselves. <laughs>